So I'm going to speak for five or ten minutes about some personal background issues, uh, and then turn to some topics that I think are important today. I'm sort of, I will quickly go past uh, what some people have claimed to be my accomplishments, uh, uh, which Noam has already exaggerated, uh, and um, uh, get to topics that I think are worth my time at any rate at the moment actually to investigate today because I think they're ongoing problems and I think that technology is helping us uh, to do much better in investigating them than we have in the past. So this is me uh, with my male parent. Uh, maybe is there a way of turning this light off? It makes it, it seems to be making that pretty dim unless it puts everybody to sleep. Okay, so if you look carefully at my expression uh, <laughs> you'll see that I was a little uncertain about what was going to happen, because I knew exactly what was going to happen. Uh, my father was brought up in Europe, and uh, there's a particular way that children are abused by their male parents, uh, which consists of putting uh, the fists on either cheek and then rubbing like this. Uh, and so I knew what was coming. Uh, <laughs> but uh, tried to be polite. Here's a better look at uh, <laughs> uh, what was going on and, and how I felt about it. Uh, so there's something to what Noam said, that, that my stance, I don't think because of this particular class of events, but for other reasons, uh, I've, I have been in the role of being skeptical. Uh, but really, uh, we, we come here today because ostensibly, and I appreciate so many people coming, uh, ostensibly because it's my birthday. But really, it's, a, it's everybody's birthday in this room. Uh, the uh, uh, way of looking at it is to ask, you know, how many linguistics departments were there in 1939 when I was born? Don't know, 10, 20? Very small number worldwide. Uh, and today, according to Wikipedia, there are at least 300. <laughs> Uh, so something happened, uh, something to do with one or more people in this room. Uh, but at the time, in that general era, uh, Leonard Bloomfield, who was what the major uh, linguist of his day, with good reason, uh, he is reputed to have said to some aspiring student who came to discuss uh, linguistics with him, he said, young man, go into linguistics as a career only if you have no moral alternative. <laughs> uh, because it wasn't really a, recognized as a field. It lived within anthropology departments and, and language departments and so on uh, in the hearts and minds of people who had a bead on the importance of studying language. So a uh, little one more bit about me and then I'll go to some current stuff. So I was incredibly lucky. Uh, I mean, it's just amazing. If you, I guess we all have pathways uh, and, and can see how luck played a role in wherever we are and, and whatever we're doing. But this is, in my opinion, was pretty extraordinary within this restricted world. So I was present at the famous, uh, uh, we could call it interview, or you could call it joust, or you could call it destruction, uh, of uh, the ideas that Skinner was proposing in general about stimulus response psychology where Skinner had, uh, been, been, uh, had the temerity to apply uh, his ideas to language. Uh, and uh, that, of course, they didn't work, for, to say the least. Uh, and Noam was invited by George Miller in his graduate class that I had shoehorned myself into uh, on the psychology of language to have a special meeting, and I was there. And I thought, I mean, you know, I mean, Noam was, he was 29 or something like that at the time. Uh, Skinner was 60 and very much in his prime and uh, very pleased with himself. Uh, and um, uh, the, it, it, it's like one of these cartoons where the, one of the characters is, has his head is sliced off and his neck is sliced off and so on and so on. And then suddenly somewhere in the cartoon everything clatters down. Uh, well, that's what happened to Skinner intellectually. He had no idea that that's what had happened, but the rest of us did. And then I had an amazing sequence of advisors. I ended up with Morris uh, for undergraduate. Rahman was a real trip. He was, he was my advisor for two years, but 
and there are lots of stories I could tell about that. It'd be much more fun than this talk, but nonetheless, <laughs> I won't. Uh, but uh, when I went to, I'd met uh, uh, Morris through, because Morris was Noam's favorite student, uh, sorry, Jacobson's favorite student, um, and I was doing some projects and so on that Morris was interested in. And that led me to join the uh, linguistics department at, at MIT. So there I was with, with Noam giving lectures on syntax and everybody in the room was going, uh-huh, uh-huh, I see. And I didn't understand beans. Uh, I thought syntax was this mysterious cult in which, pe which people talked about the, what they called linguistic intuitions that were like vaporous. I mean, they were, you, it, it went away. Uh, and some of them had such clear, strong intuitions and such strong beliefs in this versus that. I decided, I, I mean, it's going to take me a while. I better study something else within the framework of this program. Uh, and that was phonology with Morris, which was much more concrete. You knew when you, you, knew when you got a better answer. You didn't know when you got the right answer. Uh, but at least you knew that answer A was better than answer B. Uh, and that was very comforting. And then I, later on, I just had wonderful, amazing collaborators. Noam mentioned uh, the research on uh, click mislocation and its bearing on uh, the processing evidence for actual phrases and phrase structure and how it works. Well, that was research that was partially invented by Merrill, uh, often the, the pastures of Illinois, uh, and in a speech department yet. Uh, it shows you something about Merrill, and he was really knew how to invent stuff. And Jerry, uh, who does do a lot more than, or did do a lot more than just tell jokes, uh, although he's very good at that. Uh, and with Jacques Mailer, who became a lifelong uh, collaborator, both in practical issues like starting the journal Cognition and in a lot of research in different areas. And then I just had this raft of other collaborators. I won't talk about every one. Uh, but, of course, in fact, I won't even talk about one. Uh, but I've highlighted some of those who probably are known to, to many of you. Uh, it's really an amazing array. It's just a fantastic initial luck and a series of very fortunate uh, happenstances after that. So I will practice Cicerone and Praetorician for those of you who studied Latin uh, uh, on... Um, various areas that I've worked in that Noam already discussed, so I'm not going to say beans about it. Uh, uh, the Ciceronian Pride tradition comes from Cicero's introduction to his attack on a corrupt Roman, uh, in which he says, I'm not going to say all the things that are wrong with you. I won't say this, I won't say that, I won't say all the bad things he did. Well, okay, so I'm not going to talk about all the good things that people say I've done, but there's a bit. Um, and um, the reason is, I think, not, not, it's not necessarily boring, but uh, I don't know about the answer to that one, but uh, it's not really what I'm focusing on today. I mean, life is a journey, and my profession is a journey, and my research is a journey, and I'm trying to move ahead. But I will mention one thing, uh, which is about this sentence. I mean, 300 years from now, uh, when uh, the real theory of language and how universal laws created and all that has been well understood, and Noam is a name for the uh, scholars uh, who reach back in time as to how all of these important things were discovered. The one thing that everybody will still remember, probably, or still keep re-remembering, is colorless green ideas sleep furiously. That's an, you know, it's, a, it's just such a pungent example. Well, I have created, just by accident, when I was shaving once to try to make a point for a class I was teaching, uh, a lesser example, but an example nonetheless that I feel is going to go on my epitaph, uh, if anything does, and that's the horse race past the barn fell. Uh, it's, a, it's, a widely under, it's a widely quoted example because of the points it makes. Uh, and one of the questions, the interesting question is, why is it such a ringer? Why is it so hard, unless you're really treating it in a scholarly way, to recognize that it's grammatical? And I'll just say in a short form, the reason is, I think, 
that the correct analysis actually embeds the incorrect analysis. Uh, so you start with an incorrect surface analysis, thinking that the horse race that passed the barn, is the, that's it, that's the sentence. Then you discover there's this thing fell at the end. Uh, and so you have to recompute it, and when you recompute it, the correct analysis, the horse that was raced past the barn, brings you back to a causative construction, namely, the horse raced past the barn. Namely, was caused, the horse w w that was caused to race past the barn. And so it brings you back to that same sequence, uh, and I think that's probably the reason why it's such a pungent example of a garden path sentence that you can't, it's very, except as a scholarly matter, it's very hard to undo it intuitively. Okay, so that's an aside. So, so much for background and past and all that. Uh, so what I'm gonna talk about today are three areas of uh, research that I hope will occupy me for the next five to 10 years, or more. <laughs> After all, I have such a terrific example leading me. Uh, so, uh, I, I won't read them all because they, I think I'll just launch right into one. Uh, so the first is a perennial problem. Uh, we have a formal grammar. Of, I use the word formal simply to distinguish it from a behavioral model or a neurological model. Uh, and uh, this raises a lot of uh, puzzling questions, uh, namely how it uh, can be embedded or possibly be irrelevant or possibly be sitting on the side uh, in one of those Marian uh, universes, that's from the theoretician Mar, a visual scientist and computer scientist. Uh, so what is the relationship between uh, this very intricate, interesting, exciting model of what language is in relation to what the brain and the kids do when they learn it and so on. And so there have been history of failures, history of a very simple-minded, and we look back and can say that, uh, ideas about the relation of grammar and behavior that failed uh, against facts. I mean, they didn't fail because people got tired of them. They failed because they actually could generate some pr predictions that turned, just turned out to be wrong. And as no implied, I played some role in showing that it was wrong. Um, and the other problem is that uh, well, firstly, the prob one of the problems about the whole question, it used to be called, is grammar psychologically real? That was the question. Well, it was an, a way of framing research, but in point of fact, linguistic intuitions, the belief that if I know English, this is a sentence and that isn't a sentence, and this could become a sentence if we change it this way, and, you know, and so on, uh, these are all as real as experimental results. In fact, as I suggest here, maybe they're more real uh, because you can quickly get them and then you can quickly uh, think of counterexamples if there are counterexamples to be thought of and move on to the next I theoretical idea without having to design an experiment, go in the laboratory, run the pilot experiment, run the real experiment, do the statistics according to the latest statistical model, send it off to a journal, get it back with bad reviews, but one good review, and so they encourage you to revise it, so you revise it, and then you send it. And about three years later, after you initially started, something gets published, you show it to the linguists, and they say, as in the Nixon White House, oh, that idea isn't operative anymore. Uh, <laughs> So the thing that you were testing the reality of had evaporated uh, into uh, a new theory. And so let's look briefly at the history of uh, different architectures that have been proposed for uh, within the framework of generative syntax and, and just ask simply, you know, what is consistent across these models, some of which are so different from each other. So it starts in the public world with syntactic structures with a big thing, pile of papers called Logical Structure of Linguistic Theory lurking behind it, uh, at which really created the, the first major revolution in the, in the context of linguistics of the day. And then various other models uh, that uh, in each case, one way or another were argued uh, to uh, involve a simplification. Generative semantics was argued that way. It turned out that it was actually the opposite, uh, but that's another story. Uh, government and binding theory, so-called, 
And we arrive today at minimalism, so-called. It's called that because it's supposed to be the most elegant, simple, direct uh, model of, that will tell us what the structure of language is. But of course, it's the best model so far. You know, who knows what's coming down the pike? Uh, but the major features of this model, are, are there are two of them that we can isolate. There's more, but it's basically simple. That's the point. So there's one, uh, one structure building uh, computational process, uh, which is recursive merge or recursive merges, one or two types, but basically very related. Uh, and the other is one kind of structural process, which is the principle that uh, linguistic uh, representation and language uh, is uh, structure dependent, that is to say, dependent on hierarchical organization, not on serial organization, even though the language that we are presented with, certainly in the auditory mode, is massively serial. Uh, so what I'd like to do is to uh, play a, a, a demonstration by Monse Sands, who's sitting over there, uh, uh, with whom I did some of the work that Noam uh, cites on uh, telicity and related uh, phenomena, uh, just to clarify the nature of the problem. So here's, here's going to be an example of uh, building a sentence, uh, and what Monse did with this example is to uh, give us a, 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 an acoustic rendering of each operation. So that's when you put two things together, basically. Uh, I don't know why she chose the camera shutter, but there was a reason, I'm sure. Uh, and then after that, you, you pull things out of a lexicon somewhere and add them in. Uh, and then, uh, you have to make sure that the hierarchical structure with the lexical items in it is conforming to certain kinds of restrictions. So then we, we're checking agreement between units. Uh, okay, that's checking, all right. And then finally you're getting ready and actually moving something from one position to another. Okay, so here goes the um, derivation for a three-word sentence in Spanish. Uh, the boy arrived. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it, it's, I'm, it, I'm going to play the sequence of operations as fast as PowerPoint will let me do it, which is, of course, obviously, if it were really what we do in our minds or head, wouldn't be near fast enough. Okay, so he firstly, in this particular version of uh, minimalism, which has changed somewhat in the last few years, but it's basically still related, is you, you grab a bunch of lexical items that are going to be in the sense, and then you do this. Okay, I have to say this is, this is pure genius on, <laughs> on Monse's part, uh, just fantastic. Well, anyway, so what do all the models have in common? I mean, trying to not so much worry about a particular uh, syntactic set of processes, but looking back from today to 19, the mid-1950s, looking at what's sort of consistently played a role in these differently configured architectures of how a grammar, work, a grammar works, major feature is their derivations. Sentences are the result of building structures. Uh, and uh, that's a constant in, in these different models. Uh, and I think it's, made, it's not entirely unique to generative, uh, so-called generative uh, grammar viewpoints, but I think it's intrinsically characteristic of the generative viewpoint, of the generative program. Uh, and so uh, one of the uh, lines of research that I won't go through in, in any detail, but just I'll refer to it, was first to try to demonstrate that derivations in one form or another actually are computed during uh, different kinds of language behavior. And I, I won't, that's an entirely separate lecture of its own because it involves a lot of technical stuff as well as various kinds of experimentation. But the fact is there is some evidence for that. Not enough to convince everybody, but I frankly think there never will be enough to convince everybody. But uh, there is some, and so we, in my view, we have to take the concept of derivation seriously. Well then the problem we're faced with is language behavior goes very quickly. I don't think you're aware of applying a whole bunch of things like what Monse was depicting, even if you're doing it really fast, 
uh, as you uh, listen to my, me talking and you understand what I'm saying. And what's interesting is that you understand what I'm saying intuitively, you understand it instantly. And th so the question is, uh, how would we mate that intuition with some evidence that in fact you're also assigning derivations of this massive complexity in almost all cases to sentences that you've never heard before. Uh, and so there's a, there's a real conceptual problem in model building. And here's an ugly solution. The ugly solution is that there's a dual root, which is not the first time it's been proposed in cognitive science. Uh, and, uh, uh, or especially in, in, in language behavior and so on, that uh, we um, understand sentences initially by applying certain kinds of statistically uh, well-founded practice, lubricated and so on, patterns. This is very basically pattern recognition. Uh, and then that leads us to an immediate interpretation of the meaning, but then there's evidence that in fact a few hundred milliseconds later uh, the uh, aspects of a representation of a sentence that themselves depend on a derivation come into being in the, in the mental representation in the mind. And so uh, it's at that point uh, that, that we uh, have this kind of idea that uh, to some, in it, putting it sort of crudely that we understand everything twice. Once with rather simple direct pattern recognition and the other with more elaborate computational uh, derivations. Um, and there is a, there's evidence to a number of the kinds of predictions that this makes. A simple demonstration is a sentence like, the double take sentences like, more people have gone to Russia than I have. That's obviously grammatical, right? More people have gone to Russia than I have. Well. It, at first, in general, people say, oh yeah, that's a sentence. And then, wait a minute, that's not a sentence. That doesn't mean anything. Uh, and so the point is that it, it looks like a sentence because it conforms to the surface pattern, but when you then try to put the pieces together, uh, you realize it's not working right. Uh, and so there are other phenomena that may be uh, related to this. Uh, and so, uh, again, how it would, uh, would create understanding of why the horse raced past the barn fell uh, is such a difficult sentence to recognize. Okay, so this is an example of uh, analysis by synthesis, which is a model that, with that name or not with that name, pops up in many different areas of cognitive science, uh, not just language. Uh, because there, there are dual or multiple roots in perception and, uh, and uh, understanding the world as to how we do it. Uh, and so integrating those roots uh, requires either to say, I don't think most of those roots are important, it's only this one that's important, uh, or to try to construct a model that at least allows you how to put them in relation to each other potentially. Of course, we're not at the end. Uh, of, th of this way of thinking. Uh, there are other pr issues like how do we integrate this kind of model with discourse on the one hand and with neurological uh, evidence that is uh, constantly emerging every day on the other hand. Okay, the second point I want to uh, discuss, seventh kind of research, is the issue that No mentioned uh, related to familial handedness. And the thing that's interesting about that uh, is that uh, if there are effects uh, on how you organize, represent behaviorally and neuro neurologically language, even though you're strongly right-handed, if there are differences in how you do that as a function of handedness background, if you have left-handers in your background, that's the, the left-handers in your background serves as a kind of proxy for some variability in genetic uh, inheritance, uh, or in how you grow up in a family, possibly. I mean, we don't, you know, it could be a mixture. Uh, and so it, it gives us a tool uh, for uh, geneticists, because what geneticists constantly clamor for uh, when trying to find the genetic basis for uh, a, um, 
a skill, a cognitive capacity that's unique in our case to humans. Uh, they say, give us a phenotype. We need phenotypic variation that's well, that's well defined. Then if we have people of type A, people of type B, we can now do genome-wide stuff and all that stuff that they do uh, and try to pick out uh, uh, different uh, particular peculiarities uh, in the DNA of, of group A versus group B. But we need a clear phenotypic dif differentiation first. The interesting thing about uh, uh, people with, that's FS plus, and people without, uh, uh, lexic uh, without uh, familial uh, left-handedness somewhere in their family envelope, their recent family envelope, um, is it's almost 50-50. So almost half the right-handers report one or more left-handers in this envelope, and uh, that gives us an enormous population base uh, with a lot of complexity, of course, and difficulties that follow with that. Uh, but it has at least that advantage compared with using particular syndromes like Williams syndrome or even Down syndrome or other cases uh, that are, are very well defined in many cases, although not, all, not always, uh, but uh, which are fortunately, uh, in those cases, rare, uh, which makes it harder to do genetic analysis. Uh, so, ooh, uh, it also brings out the difficulties in spelling sometimes. Uh, so, um, the question that's raised, and I'm going to give you some evidence that uh, there are neurological and behavioral differences. The, the big question that's raised is are there implications and what are they for the usual belief? Uh, that we are really studying one brain and one representation, one place where re language is represented, and its name is Broca's area, and maybe Wernicke's area, and maybe some pathways between them, and maybe some other stuff uh, that surrounds them, uh, but that basically it, it's all the same for everybody it, within some normal variation, but it's basically the same framework for everybody. Uh, and that, of course, leads to, if that was true, which it may be, it leads to some relatively lazy thinking about uh, the, uh, why it is that humans have uh, the ability for language and it's unique. The answer would be, oh, well, it's because we have this unique, particular, universal neurological organization. Well, that doesn't really answer the question, does it? It just says, we've got this, if it's true, constant neurological organization, and we all have language, we don't understand beads about either, so they must be the same. Uh, and it's not the first area where that kind of reasoning is uh, prolific. So, uh, but at any rate, the first question is, are, is there, are there real differences between these two uh, types of right-handers? So this is just one experiment to give you an idea of the kind of evidence that we have. So, um, there's a phenomenon called the early left anterior negativity, which I believe was actually discovered, or at least published, and that's what counts, uh, here by two people who are sitting next to each other, among others, and, and the guy over there, namely uh, Janet, Andy, and Ken. Oh, Janet, Andy, Ken, and Meryl. <laughs> My God. Uh, so. Uh, and this, uh, I, of course, I was happy to pick this because I knew of its lineage. On the other hand, there are people who for years were building their careers about neuro, in neurolinguistics on this phenomenon. Uh, so it was, it, it was a very important uh, discovery or creation. Uh, and uh, the idea, uh, the fact is that when you present somebody with a, a slight kind of ungrammatical uh, point in a, in a sequence, uh, it occasions uh, a, a left anterior, yeah, these guys in the EEG world make negativity go up. Uh, the reason they do that is because when they got started, they thought it was all about electrons, and electrons are negative, and so there's more electrons, so it should go up. Uh, so uh, uh, that's why this response here uh, is higher, it's more negative uh, in, in this way of presenting things, at the frontal uh, left area. Uh, so here's an example, this is from German, uh, of an ungrammatical sentence. So in German, 
you can say uh, the trumpet was blown, that sequence of words, but you can tr also say the, the trombone, in this case, the trombone was at the concert blown. But if you don't get the concert in there, if you just say the trombone was at the blown, that's ungrammatical. I mean, as soon as you hear the word blown, uh, it, it's not a grammatical sentence. So here's an example. Die Trompete wurde geblasen. So that's the trumpet was blown. Die Posaune wurde zur geblasen. So the, trom the Posaune, trombone, was zur, that's German, the preposition zu, der, put together in zur, that's the at the, uh, blown. So that's ungrammatical. Uh, and that elicits the, uh, the typical uh, early left anterior negativity. A different group uh, in Leipzig uh, also found a corresponding kind of response in the case of music, but it was in the right hemisphere, uh, so-called early right anterior negativity, if a musical sequence had some kind of anomaly. Okay, that's normal, right? Boring, but normal. Uh, okay, here's one that's not quite so normal. Exactly, ooh. <laughs> but not dissonant, just, just not right. <laughs> uh, and so that is the kind of stimulus which typically elicits the early right anterior negativity. Well, I was visiting uh, Leipzig, uh, the institute where, in fact, Frederici is and others, uh, including the group that was doing this with music, and they were telling me that even the ELAN has a lot of subject variability. Statistically, it exists, but there are quite a few subjects that show, if anything, the opposite, they were telling me. And similarly, even more strongly in the case of the early right anterior negativity for music. So I, with my uh, belief in the universal elixir, uh, so the universal scientific elixir of familial handedness, said, aha, let's differentiate the subjects according to familial handedness, which nobody does. Everybody says, oh, we should only use right-handers. They all know enough to know that. Uh, but nobody thinks about uh, the possibility that there are different flavors of right-handedness. So we did that. Uh, and uh, here's a description of the experiment. Uh, we had a bunch of sentences that were normal. Die Maus wurde gefangen. That's the mouse was caught. Der Fußball wurde vorm gefangen. That's the incorrect one. The, the football was before the caught. If you had said the football was before the fence caught, that would be German. Uh, and then the subjects thought that they were detecting a change of voice. Die Torte wurde gebacken. The cake was baked. Uh, and so they thought they were just to push a button whenever there was a voice change. Uh, well, here is a depiction of the data in the um, millisecond range for the early left anterior negativity. And this is the data for uh, the uh, subjects without familiar left-handedness. And this is whether uh, the anterior negativity was primarily left. Uh, and you can see that out of 24 subjects, uh, without, familial, without reported familiar left-handedness, it was quite a preponderance. But if you look at people with familiar left-handedness, uh, you see that it was really nothing there, certainly nothing statistically. Uh, and so, uh, that was a clue that, uh, that, that this, to why there's variability that's generally reported in the ELAN. Well, then we did the same with music. Okay. Again, not awful, but just slightly wrong. Uh, and then in this case, they thought that they were detecting a change in the instrumentation. Okay. So, and this is what we got. Now the important thing about this result is uh, this. You think about somebody who's right-handed and they had left-handed fam uh, familial member, uh, left-handed family members, and you think, well, maybe they just use their right hemisphere for more of everything. Uh, and that's why they don't show a strong left anterior negativity. Uh, and so we would predict that they would show an even stronger right anterior negativity to music. But notice the opposite happens. Uh, and that suggests 
that uh, what's at issue is um, some, to some extent the possibility of reorganization as a function of familial left-handedness. Not just that you use your right hemisphere more for everything, but something about using it maybe more for language results in other kinds of uh, organization for other kinds of cognitive skills and possibly an overall difference in organization. So one of the things we did to try to increase the power of what we're doing, uh, this was with a very, very brilliant uh, graduate student, Roland Hancock, uh, constructed, we constructed a genomic model of the risk for left-handedness, basically collecting uh, family data from, what I, by the time this was done, I think 12,000 undergraduates, uh, probably noisy, probably incorrect in many cases, and missing things and so on, uh, but nonetheless, uh, getting some report on which of their family tree depicted here really uh, had familiar, had left-handers, applying a standard methodology uh, for computing risk based on uh, heredity, family, family traits. Uh, and now we can ask, is there a correlation between, uh, instead of just asking, are there left-handed family members in your background, but rather creating a uh, continuous scale of the risk that you would have been left-handed, because in that population of 12,000, roughly 1,200 or a little more, were probably left-handed. So now you can compare, compare the pattern of left-handedness in their family background against the pattern of uh, uh, explicit right-handers, uh, and you can uh, see, but you're basically looking at the left-handers only to compute this function, uh, what, is the, what are the patterns that result in explicit left-handedness? Uh, and so that is a way of measuring the risk, as the geneticists put it, not that being left-handed is risky, uh, but uh, what do they know? Uh, so um, it, you, you, you compute the genetic risk uh, uh, for having been left-handed even though you now are right-handed. And so now we can correlate that metric against the uh, 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 increase or decrease, sorry, the increase in left, as it goes up, in a left anterior negativity for music, but a decrease in left anterior and, uh, uh, negativity for language. And you see, I should have put all the little dots here, uh, just not, not the solid lines, but there, there's, a, there are, there's a significant difference in the correlations at any rate. Um, so, as I say, uh, this suggests that there really is a reorganization, not just you use your right hemisphere more. Okay, so now back to this. So what do we do about this? Well, we don't, we, there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, so in the case of language, we don't know what it is that leads to uh, f people with familiar left-handedness actually accessing lexical items faster and better and more strongly. I didn't show you experiments about that because of time, but that's a very strong finding uh, across a wide range of paradigms. So it, it, we don't know the, it, whether the nature of the lexical representation that they access is really syntactically bound or whether it's associative, for example. I mean, so uh, the way in which people with familiar left-handedness go after lexical items is uh, based on their imagery, image imagery or their complex associations with other ideas or knowledge, uh, or whether it really is indicative and reflective of syntactic-based uh, kinds of characteristics that lexical item has, lexical items have. Well, that's, that's an empirical question, and uh, there are ways of testing it, which I'm beginning to work on. Okay. So now, that's that. Yeah, as it says, more research needed. There we are. <laughs> uh, so there's still work to be done. Finally, the last ta point uh, bears on issues of consciousness and related things. Uh, and um, the most important point of this, I won't take time to read everything on the slide, the most important point is the question of whether context actually in a sentence that you're hearing or in sentences can work backwards. 
without your being aware of that. In other words, we think that we understand everything that we hear as we hear it. We think there's a pairing of the acoustics with at least the word representation uh, as the acoustics comes in. We hear the, the noises and it automatically gives us the words uh, and maybe to some extent even automatically gives us the meaning at least of the phrases as they come in. Uh, and what I'm going to show is, I think, some evidence that that's just not that simple. So here are some data that was provided uh, by Natasha um, from her studies. She brings a uh, subject into the lab uh, and with prearrangement uh, has the subject call a friend and has an, a sort of gossip session with the friend. Uh, and uh, pretty soon, presumably at first, the conversation's a little stilted, the subjects know that some graduate students are going to be pawing over whatever they're saying. But then after a while, it gets pretty natural. Uh, they um, are just gossiping away. And Natasha's interested in particular uh, things that have to do with uh, uh, the timing and compression of particular uh, elements of interest. Uh, but what I was interested in is uh, looking into the question of whether snippets simply are impossible to understand by themselves, that they depend on context. So here's something taken out of a context. Granted. Okay, that sequence corresponds to four syllables, arguably four words, or two words when two words, each of which is a contraction of two words. So you can think of it either way. I'll play it once more. Granted. Okay, so here's the larger context. But either way, there's, I mean, I can't register in person, so they're just going to have to deal with that. Going to have to. Going to have to. Going to have to. It's going to have to. Uh, I'll play it once more. But either way, there's, I mean, I can't register in person, so they're just going to have to deal with that. Okay. Here's another example. Okay, this, is, this corresponds to also four words. Uh, you should think ca Southern California, that might help. I can give you that general context. Or uh, Tuesday night uh, when we were chilling in the spa, but... Chilling in, chilling in the... Chilling in the... Chilling in the... Uh, is what that little snippet is. So the point is, when it's in the context, in this case preceding and following, uh, it's just like that. You don't realize that most of what you thought you heard wasn't there. Uh, what was there were cues that could be related to other parts that had cues that you could put together into a, a conscious representation. Part of the very interesting property being that you're, re in a sense, retrospectively recreating uh, the uh, conscious experience, which is a bit creepy. Uh, okay, I've already explained this. Now here's an example where the only context uh, is what follows. And this is why, I, in part, I'm very interested in the issue of a backwards context impact on our consciousness, our conscious experience of language. Do you have time? Do you have time? Any takers? Okay, now listen to this. It's also four words. Do you have time to talk to me for a little while? <laughs> Do you have time? Do you have time? There's a little hint of a nasal there. Do you have time? That's the M. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, other things. But uh, uh, the point is, I, I really don't think that... Do you have time to talk to me for a little while? That there's a sensation that I, I had no idea what I heard. Oh, now I know. That's not the, that's not the phenomenology of this. Uh, and that's, I think, really important. In part, just because it, it's weird. Uh, and not what we might expect. And in part because maybe we can use it as a tool to explore uh, a little bit more about conscious experience. Uh, but before I get to that, for the linguists in the audience, uh, always preoccupied with the poverty of the stimulus, uh, to show how important our knowledge of language that we have innately is, uh, we all think, no, I'm sorry, we don't all think this, but. Number, a number of people think that mothers and fathers uh, really make it easy for the child to learn language. 
not necessarily because everything they say is grammatical, but because they really pronounce it all very carefully with exaggerated intonation uh, and so on and so on. Well, uh, here's an example of, this is from Real Mother Ease, which I simply captured from a database called Childus, um, uh, which suggests what I think we knew anyway. Well, how are we doing? That's only three words. Okay, here's the uh, longer uh, sentence, and as I pointed out at other times when discussing this, I'm very glad I didn't have this mother. Uh, and when you hear how she, what she was actually saying, you'll understand why. Well, great, mommy moved those magazines so you couldn't get them and rip them. You get that? I'll play it again. This is a mother who's very pleased with herself from having made it difficult for the kid to do something that the kid wants to do. Oh, great, she says. Well, great, mommy moved those magazines so you couldn't get them and rip them. It's the and rip them. <laughs> okay, so you understand the point. Now the problem is how to how do you how to turn this into a a um, how to turn this into a, a, a scientific uh, investigation. One way is to go back to the 1950s when all you had to do to get a grant was to spell your name properly uh, and uh, hire uh, a raft of graduate students who would listen to uh, hours of tapes that. Uh, uh, Natasha and her students generate and classify them all and pick out particular uh, subsequences that you're looking for as to help us define what is the unit over which forward and or backward processing can occur. Well, there's a, there are a number of different uh, options and I'll mention a few of them. Uh, I'm going to take a side swipe at feed forward as the uh, universal uh, solution to all these kinds of problems because we're looking at feed backward. Uh, so what's at issue is feeding, <laughs> uh, whether it's forward or backward. And um, I, I just have an aside which is if you think about what the kid has to be doing, uh, if you go back to the kid example, the kid um, we think, the usual thing that's thought, and when Noam gives examples of the poverty of the stimulus, the words are always clearly uh, assumed to have been properly recognized. The problem was to get the uh, compositional constraints right. But the words aren't there. So what on earth is a two-year-old, a one-and-a-half-year-old, what does the one-and-a-half-year-old have to do to figure out this now multi-layer uh, perceptual problem. Uh, and uh, I think it brings in the possibility that in fact structure dependence, the uh, automatic uh, recognition and computing uh, language in terms of hierarchical organization, in terms of phrases in other words, is something that is already available by the end of the first year of life. Because the child has to be doing something has to have some concept of unit within which uh, uh, context can play a role in order to even get at the words, to then have the problem of figuring out the constraints, assuming that there really is a problem. So here's how we can turn it into a experimental paradigm. We've just started doing it. So these examples are pretty crude. They do sound better on earphones than uh, in, uh, and I won't explain much about them yet. So just listen to this sentence. Our visiting cousin fixed the tent in the large fender before our trip. Okay. Meryl's looking puzzled. <laughs> uh, some of you are not looking puzzled, but maybe you should. Uh, okay, so that is supposed to be, the, the some of you uh, fixed the dent in the large fender. Okay, here's a corresponding uh, sentence. Our visiting cousin fixed the tent in the large campground. Okay, that's supposed to be the tent. So what's going on here? Why is, why is Jay's name popping up there? <laughs> You'll see why in a minute, I guess. Uh, okay, so what's at issue is a, is, a car, is a paradigm that was invented by Conine and her colleagues, uh, which was all behavioral, in which she took 
words with initial uh, stop consonants and found versions of them that were midway between voiced and unvoiced uh, when heard independently and then put them in contexts of various kinds. In her case, they were preceding contexts, not following, because everybody would take it as obvious that only the preceding context could really be doing the work, right? So, uh, and got behavioral results that what people reported they heard was indeed that which was forced, if you want to think of it that way, by the context. Well, what can we do with this paradigm? Well, firstly, we can design various different kinds of contexts, and I'll give you some examples of that, and use this as the basis for turning the observation from natural conversations from data like Natasha's into an experimental body, uh, into a, a, a real investigation uh, uh, where we can really uh, parametrically vary the many aspects of uh, the experience that we're giving subjects. And now the question is, can we uh, collect data, not just behavioral reports, but some indicators that now have been alleged to be indicators in brain imaging of conscious experience uh, and use that as the fundamental uh, tool uh, uh, for developing a real body of knowledge about what kinds of uh, things actually work. And this, uh, this is interesting to me because there's also a history of paradigms uh, in which uh, discussions of the, firstly in the case of language, developed in part by Merrill, uh, and more recently uh, by Ferreira and her colleagues, on the persistence of a local meaning or a local structure in a sentence that turns out not to be the one that is actually needs to be computed. It's locally ambiguous, but in fact it's not ambiguous in the context of the whole sentence, and yet there's evidence that the totally irrelevant, unnecessary, uh, distracting meaning persists in certain ways and can be brought back into consciousness. Uh, and there's a line of research by uh, Mary uh, and Jay and John Allen and also Jay and Mary uh, that is very suggestive about ways of thinking about how context that's manipulated uh, can interact again with aspects of a stimulus, in this case a visual stimulus, which are not the actual obvious target, but which are the, an interpretation of the visual stimulus, which is not the one, in Mary's language, is the ground rather than the figure, uh, but nonetheless can be shown to have an impact in relation to a context uh, that can actually have neurological or at least EEG uh, uh, effects. And so um, I, I think that, again, this is an intuition at the moment, uh, but uh, I hope to be uh, working with Jay and also to try to ensnare Mary into some ideas. Uh, and uh, uh, really, again, turn this into a real studyable uh, phenomenon. Uh, and of course, uh, in today's world, it's not enough if you want to get something published uh, to show that you've got a, I mean, sometimes it's enough, but in general, it's better if you want to get something published, not only to show that there's some passive brain uh, response to a particular manipulation, but also that you can stop it uh, with some sort of magic beam. Uh, and in, <clears throat> locally, I'm a colleague of uh, not just Jay's, but uh, also Stuart Hameroff, uh, and uh, uh, which is, in, and they are very interested in developing uh, the use of ultrasound, which can be focused, and in fact can triangulate or multi, multi-angulate uh, on uh, particular, rather narrowly defined brain areas, internal to the brain, not just to the surface, uh, and you know there's some promise there that. Uh, uh, this also could become part of the way in which we can investigate this. So I would just uh, close this section and then close the talk with the question of what is the unit uh, within which this interesting context effect can occur? Well, in the large fender, that's a phrase. To dent in the large fender, okay, that's a, that's a phrase. But there's no verb there. So there's no thematic assignment in the usual sense of thematic assignment. 
But if we had a phase, the tendent weakening the fender, kind of a lame example, but uh, the point about it is that it's no longer to get to the fender in there than it is in the first one. Uh, but uh, there's a verb form that interposes that actually assigns a theme, a thematic uh, uh, role uh, to the detend, which is the agent of doing something to the fender. Uh, and so that gives it a different status in linguistic theory, in current linguistic theory, uh, which may close off this particular uh, phrase uh, from modifying this, or may strengthen it. I mean, that's an empirical question whether if it's thematically related to uh, within a phrase that actually increases the bonding or the binding to use a general term that's used for these sorts of things uh, or whether it actually uh, weakens it don't know but the point is it can be studied and of course we can also back up uh, 50 years and uh, argue that oh it must be just the sequence of words that are strongly associated with each other so for example we wouldn't expect to get uh, backwards uh, effects in a case like this, where a large pillar can have a, can't have a tent in it, it could have a dent in it, but that's not really very highly associated compared with a dent and a fender. And so something else we can waste our time killing something that should have died 50 years ago. Uh, okay, so this is what I've gone through. I will just uh, close really with just one major issue. Uh, which cuts across the cognitive sciences uh, that I, I don't have an immediate elixir for, but which is touched on by many of the points that I have made. And that is, where does the brain get all this computational power anyway? Uh, in the terms that are used within linguistics, externalizing language, and probably externalizing experience in general, requires some kind of connection to the to neural sensory motor interfaces. Okay, we can grasp that, but the question is whether that's all there is. So Randy Gallistel and others uh, have pointed out that neurons are too slow, they're too limited in uh, uh, how, what they actually, the sort of computational uh, stuff they can do uh, for the vastness of memory and for the speed of computations. And to quote from uh, Randy, in the brain there must be something else, somewhere, uh, uh, that is uh, playing a role uh, in uh, uh, what really makes consciousness possible and possibly what makes language possible. So there are different options, classic options. One, they're all reductionist one way or another because what else can we do? But uh, there are, there's downward reduction. Go find something tinier than a neuron and say, okay, that's it. That's where it all must be really working. Uh, and the thing that's tinier in the neuron is the skeleton that stops the neuron from collapsing on itself, otherwise known as microtubules. Uh, and, but maybe that skeleton does something else and there is evidence uh, emerging that with tiny, 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 tiny electrodes, uh, that maybe the skeleton itself can take on different uh, charges, different states, and could actually be computational, uh, a computational engine inside each neuron. All right, well, that's hypothetical, uh, <laughs> maybe. Uh, or there's upward reductionism. We don't think of that normally as reductionist, but let's go to the whole brain and look at the oscillations at different frequencies and when they're in phase and when they're out of phase. Uh, and uh, uh, how that all interacts with the sensory motor interfaces to get behave, you know, to get stimuli in and analyze and to get behavior out uh, as the uh, interface. And then finally, there's a very interesting possibility. Uh, and in, in this case, I'm going to close the content part of this talk uh, with a quote from a letter that Noam sent me in 1969. So I was fussing intellectually. I would graduated a few years earlier uh, and um, uh, had a job where I didn't have to teach so all I could think about was whatever it is I was thinking about. Uh, I didn't have to worry about what students were thinking about, although that was terribly boring and that's why I left that job. But nonetheless, in thinking about just what I could think about, 
I became puzzled as to as the, sent the extent to which aspects of language don't seem to have an obvious biological basis. And by obvious biological basis, I, I use reference, for example, to color vision. So color vision has uh, the fact that red is the opposite, so-called, of green and yellow and blue and so on. This has physiological uh, correspondence at any rate, and we can say explanations. Uh, but in the case of language, nothing like that seemed so clear. And so I was toying with uh, ideas as to what kind of non-physiological constraints would structure language to be the way it is. I was in New York. I was surrounded by a bunch of Platonists, uh, uh, linguistics Platonists. Uh, Terry Langendone, who was my good friend and colleague, Paul Postel, uh, and um, Jerry Katz, also a good friend and colleague. Postal was a good colleague. <laughs> I didn't know him as well as the others. Uh, so, and they were developing the idea that language is a platonic form. Grammar is a platonic form. Grammar is uncaused. It's like numbers. And of course, Noam is pointing out today, well, it is a little bit like numbers, but not necessarily because it's a platonic form. Maybe, and what Noam wrote to me, I wrote, I wrote Noam a sort of anguished letter as a recent student, uh, having finally discovered to some extent what syntax was about and that it wasn't entirely a cult. Uh, I wrote to Noam and explained my quandary that it, what, what do we do about aspects of language which don't seem to have an obvious biological or psychological in the sense of extended from cognition or something, cause? What, what category are they? And Noam wrote me a letter which may be buried in one of the filing cabinets that has followed me around for the last 50 years, or may not, uh, in which he said, which I remember very clearly because it was like a boom, he said, well, maybe there's a natural law that we don't understand yet that actually applies when you have a bunch of multi-state entities, elements, this was the day of transistors, so people were thinking of transistors, as a model, uh, about the size of a grapefruit, big grapefruit, uh, uh, there's some natural law which applies to that particular kind of configuration in a way, and we were talking about language in that case, not consciousness, but in a way uh, that results in making language conscious, uh, possible. Well, I've been hearing that again lately as a as a possible, we don't know what that law will be, but of course, that's by definition, we don't know what that law is or will be. But it opens up a possibility since in the history of science, there are plenty of instances in which what turns out to be a natural law was governing some phenomenon or phenomena that weren't understood uh, until they were analyzed in, with reference to a particular natural law. And so that may be where we're headed. Uh, into outer space, so to speak, uh, or not. I mean, I, but I at least wanted to outline it as an option. Uh, and I really hope I someday, when I have nothing else to do but to go through my filing cabinets, the way Merrill did when he was retiring, uh, and, and tearing up most of the paper, that maybe I'll come across uh, Noam's letter. Anyway, back to the beginning. As I said, quoting uh, uh, Bloomfield, Go into linguistics as a career only if you have no moral alternative. But now I hope you understand that in my case, I had no such alternative. And so I became what you see here, at last in charge of my life. So there I was, not being apprehensive about whether my cheeks were going to be rubbed, but going for a ride. So thank you for your attention. I'm not sure about the protocol now. Uh, Massimo will will defame me or something.